Hi everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Chatter. Before we get started, I just have a few quick messages. First off, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way that you can help us grow. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. It's going to help us rank higher and get more and more views and therefore bigger and better guests. Don't forget right now, you can pre-order my book, To the Moon, The GameStop Saga. There are still four copies that you can get where you can get your name and the message to the apes put in. And if you follow the contest link in the description below, you can win one of five free signed copies or $288 worth of Riverside FM for one whole year. Please check out the link in the description below. It's free to enter and I just want to give something back. Anyway, enjoy the podcast. Are you trying to quit smoking? Maybe perhaps as part of a smoke-free January or simply to make yourself healthier in the midst of a pandemic. Well, today's sponsor is Nin Zero Tobacco Nicotine Pouches. Nin is a cutting edge synthetic nicotine pouch brand that's setting new standards for nicotine pouches in the US with its lineup of zero tobacco nicotine pouches. Nin Zero Tobacco Nicotine Pouches are the latest innovation in nicotine technology. Made with TFN synthetic nicotine, NIN pouches are available in two nicotine strengths, 3mg and 6mg, and five signature flavours, that's citrus chill, cinnamon, cool mint, spearmint and wintergreen. As a truly 100% tobacco-free product, NIN pouches do not contain any tobacco-specific nitrosamines, which are thought to be some of the most potent carcinogens found in tobacco products. Whilst tobacco-derived nicotine often features a strong, pungent odour and taste, synthetic nicotine is virtually tasteless and odourless. On a final note, we must remember that tobacco cultivation, which is commonly very heavily subsidised, can be very damaging to the environment and is often a process that is highly labour-intensive, cumbersome and wasteful. So these pouches are better for you and better for the environment. Nin pouches are made for adult users and contain tobacco-free nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. You find links for everything in the description below. Yeah, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I am here with Ted Reese, the author of Socialism or Extinction, Humanizing Production and the End of Capitalism, the Thought of Henrik Grossman. Ted, welcome to the show. Thanks for very much for having me on. Yeah, no problem. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to chat. Um, so, yeah, so you reached out on Twitter um, when we were, we were discuss- well, I was, I was commenting sort of quite angrily, probably, um, under someone talking about the, the COVID restrictions. And, and I, I have been completely confused the, literally the entire time that this pandemic has gone on after about after like six weeks, the first first month or two, I really had no idea. I was just like, I, I have no idea what to think here. I, I don't know what the right mm. thing is to do. I, I don't know. And, and I can't blame any government for panicking in that position because like, I I would not want to have been in that position. You know, yeah. it, we can all sit here and be like, well, I know what I would have done. <laughs> but like, really, you, you put, you, it's like the, it's that philo- philosophical, it's the, it's the train tracks experiment really, isn't it? It's like, you know, what bad option do we choose? Um, but one of the things that's really struck me is that a lot of people on the left who, who, who I thought cared um, about the, yeah, the, the poorest and most vulnerable in our society seem to have kind of brushed over the effects that, that things like lockdowns have had um, disproportionately on, on the most vulnerable in our society. And why do you think that is? Um, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, we we were commenting on a Navara post, I think, weren't we, on Twitter? And they were um, they they've been pro lockdown, and uh, one of one of them's openly pro vaccine passport and that sort of thing. And this is not just like your average social democrat, but uh, but. Um, a group that calls themselves communists or radical socialists or whatever. I mean, I think Navarra started out as a an anarcho-communist um, a sort of platform and then moved towards Corbyn when Corbyn got into Labour. Um, and now they seem to be to the right of Corbyn. 
especially on this issue. Um, I mean, Corbyn hasn't really spoken out about lockdowns, but he, like you say, he come out against mandates for NHS staff, and he has also come out against the the, the vaccine passport. Um, so why have they moved to the right of Corbyn? I mean, it just seems like there's that old song um, by um, Phil Oaks, "Love Me, I'm a Liberal." And there's the line in the song, 10, de 10 degrees to the left in the good times and 10 to the right in the bad times. And it's it's something to do with that. Um, you know, the, mm. the, the worse the political outlook gets, the more the sort of opportunist wing of the socialist movement or what I would call the reformist wing. And, and there isn't just one wing. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a spectrum. Um, so I'm not like dismissing the whole of the reformist left but um the further to the right you get the the more opportunistic it gets and the more sort of um the more it bends the knee to capital um when the going gets tough essentially mm. and that seems to be what's happening i mean i've compared it to the collapse of the second international when before the first world war the whole socialist or Marxist movement was um, was anti-war, and then the the First World War came along, and suddenly huge swathes of the reformist left or social democratic left suddenly um, sided with their own ruling classes in their own countries, and and so the the, the Second International collapsed. Mm. So you're saying it's basically like a a deference to power in times of crisis? Um, at partly, yeah. Um, in large part, yeah. And it's, but it's also material circumstance. Um, you know, the, the, the better off sections of the working class um, are more materially comfortable and therefore they can get through a lockdown more comfortably than, than the poorer um, the poorer sections of the working class. Uh, I'm not saying that they're getting through it easy or anything like that, but, you know, it's it's easier for some than others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard for everyone. Um, it really is. I, I just want to actually mention, um, so I did an episode with um, this professor, um, Dr. Randy Thornhill from the University of New Mexico, and he has spent 40 years studying this um, concept. It's called parasite stress. And essentially, um, if people want to know more about it, they can go watch my episode with him or uh, they can check out his interview with, with, uh, with Jordan Peterson, actually, is where I find him. But uh, the, essentially, the theory that he's been working on, and he's got a lot of evidence to back it up, is that the more prevalent that infectious disease is in a country, and it, so you, you can look at it across the world for the last 40 years, the more um, both authoritarian and right-wing the, the population and the governments tend to be. So uh, they were drawing like correlations between like the, the way that um, sort of right wing political thought is generally in sort of generally, at least anyway, born out of um, like a fear of, of the other and the outside or the unclean as such. And that there's a lot of like germaphobes and sort of Mm -hmm. fear of disease sort of all wrapped up in, in in sort of that ideology and that sort of like where that comes from so he pointed to when i was speaking to him the fact that like people like hitler and mussolini were were both um like complete germaphobes um he pointed to uh like say some of the middle eastern regions where like the wealthy upper class um tend to like some of them will bathe four times a day there's like some something in like human psychology where if you like quite, if you're very germaphobic and fear disease, it seems to make you more, yeah, more right wing and more authoritarian. And I tried to ask him if, if this is what we're seeing now. And like, he was kind of reluctant to say that this is exactly what we're seeing across the world. But I think it, for me, it would explain why people on the left have kind of shifted like weirdly upward and right on the political compass. And, and, but then that doesn't explain to me what's happened where like quite a lot of the right have suddenly become incredibly libertarian. It's like a complete, like uh, it's the complete opposite of it. And I don't know if that's tribalism or whatever, but it's, 
it's definitely a really interesting like line of thinking. Uh, on that point, I'll, I'll I'll come back to your first point. But on that point, I mean there there is competition between different capitalists, and obviously some are benefiting from the lockdowns and some aren't. So the ones who are um, are losing out are they seem to be the ones that are more anti-lockdown. There's also the the ideologically um, militant libertarian wing of of uh, of the right um but again they they are losing out they tend to be smaller or medium-sized capitalists broadly speaking um whereas it's the the monopoly uh capitalists the the you know the richest billionaires who are benefiting the most from from lockdowns whether that's you know the capitalists who own or have shares in companies like Amazon, which we've all become more dependent on for for um, in terms of online shopping. If we're locked in our houses, Netflix. Mm-hmm. If you're stuck at home and got all you can really do is is uh, watch something on on online. Um, so there's there's that there's there's that sort of split in in the right um, and between the capitalist class. Um, and the thing about monopoly capitalism is it needs to crush its competition. It needs to absorb um, the smaller and medium-sized capitals to, to to keep their own capital accumulation going. Um, I'm sure we'll talk more about that later on. But on your on your first point um, about the germophobia, I've uh, been very interested to look at that episode, but um, I've read something and i think i referenced it in my article uh well my, my essay on um on the lockdowns um that the nazis benefited from um some sort of epidemic i can't remember which one it was now it's the spanish flu yeah dr yeah. randy thornhill actually mentioned this to me he, he said he, you can you, you can plot on a state by state basis across germany the level of like there's heavy correlation between the number of people that die from the Spanish flu and the, the amount of people who voted for the Nazis, like, which is a fucking terrifying, like, I'm like, are we, yeah. are we like, is that what we're, we're going to see in the next 10 years? Like, uh... Yeah. The, the thing is where, um, the right, the author, the authoritarian right benefits from scarcity. Right. So when you get a lockdown and, um, you get, a giant cut in production, um, sc- relative scarcity rises, um, or what we call, what we would refer to, to as artificial scarcity that's imposed by capitalists in order to raise prices and therefore centralise wealth into fewer hands to keep their, you know, to rewiden their profit margins and keep capital accumulation going. Um, so... That's one side of it, um, because with scarcity, like the worker's dependence on his on his employer um, in- intensifies, so that gives the capitalists more power over of, uh, over their workers. Uh, for one thing, the other thing about germophobia is, um, I mean, it's almost like. Um, analogous to anti anti communism because like um when you read about microbiology in in the um in the journals and, and it's written by like a pro capitalist microbiologist it's very militaristic the way they talk about the need to destroy the germs um and they just keep cut you know they just keep coming and the more the more we destroy them, the the more they seem to to come at us, sort of thing. And that's how they approach like the their sort of um, their their attitude to communism is is basically the same. Like the more we attack the masses, the more they seem to turn it turn into communists. And that's the that's the fundamental problem that the ruling class has. Um, and that's yeah, that's what gives it nightmares. So they're quite analogous in, in that sense. Mm, that's an interesting point. That's a really interesting comparison, actually. Um, that, that, like, 
Think of the Viet Cong hordes, you know, like that's, it's the same thing with, with their mentality towards germs. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's absolutely fascinating as an an analogy. I mean, it's going to be fun to see if YouTube will leave this, this up once we start talking about this, but, (laughs) uh, you know, come at me, (laughs) but like the, that's, that's so real because that, that really, that info that that kind of informs the way they've responded to this in that so um this is okay i'm just going to mention it maybe they won't probably maybe they will so uh, i just i was listening to um dr peter mcculloch um on on joe rogan's podcast so yeah. i haven't i haven't listened to all of it yet but um the part I, and I, again I, I have to look i'm gonna have to look up some of the stuff to verify that he's mm. telling the truth but like, i mean yeah. I, I like i'm gonna take him at his word, but also I'm going to check anything before I uh, talk about it. But the thing that I have not checked is that he, he said that we have no like outside of hospital treatment protocol for COVID. Yeah. And that like, I, I was like, hang on, are you serious? Like we've nothing like there's, there, and, and I looked this up, this is crazy. Like, cause he was basically saying we need to prevent hospitalization or death. Like that was, that's his point. This is like, we should mm. be trying to stop people getting to the hospital. And instead, the reaction has been, we need to shut everything down and eradicate the virus instead of like figuring out how to treat people, which is like, it's like, it's, it's quite similar to what you're saying there about, about that's how they talk about biology is that, mm. and, and what has happened as well, maybe not as a result of, of the, the policies that, that we've sort of implemented, but you know, it's, it's look where we're at now where you know, Omicron has come roaring back in a more infectious version than yeah, than, than we've seen yet. And yeah, it's like, it's the exact same thing is, is coming back stronger at us by our attempts to do that, which is, yeah, you've given me a lot to think about there, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what, they're, that's what they're telling us. I'm very reluctant to believe um, or take at face value what, what we're being told um, because I mean, the South African doctors, who um, alerted the world about Omicron said it's 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 milder, like it's more transmissible, but it's milder, which is what you would expect from from a mutating virus. Because, like, I'm not an expert; I'm not going to pretend to be one. But the general gist is that they tend to um, become more transmissible and less virulent because mm-hmm. they don't want to kill off their host. Because if they do that, they die with with the host. So that seems to make sense. Obviously, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, but it can go the other way. They can mutate and, and become more more virulent because we're learning to uh, our immune systems are learning to deal with them. So they have to become more virulent." I so I don't know, but what I can certainly say is that COVID nineteen is now an industry. Um, you know where. They are, they are making, you know, certain companies are making a hell of a lot of money out of it, whether, whether it's uh, the mask industry or the vaccine industry, so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I the saw someone. Like testing the, companies, the people. Yeah, testing companies, the trade and track. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the company that has come up with the vaccine passport, that, that is a commodity. That isn't, that, the vaccines aren't free. The vaccine passport isn't free. It's going to be paid by the taxpayer. It's going to be added on to your taxes. It's a, it's a, it's a form of rent uh, rent seeking. It's a surcharge. You know, it's all of those. It's a, it's a consumer tax. You know, it's it's this is what capitalism does when it becomes when it when it falls into a deep crisis. And this is mark my words, the deepest crisis it's ever. Um, fallen into um Mm. or it will be um the 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 cap monopoly capital especially becomes increasingly dependent on state contracts i.e public debt Mm -hmm. so because because um capital and especially monopoly capital is finding it harder and harder to renew itself and expand itself because it's becoming harder and har- harder to sufficiently exploit the working class, um, its profits are very low. Um, 
its ability to satisfy shareholders who have their own, you know, um, consumption funds to satisfy, um, whether that's paying their own bills or, you know, et cetera. Um, so they need to find another source to top up their profits um, or rewiden flatlining profit margins. And that means you need to make the state your number one customer because the state has the biggest customer base. And if you can get a contract with the state, and especially if you can mandate that product, um, your quid's in. Um, so that's that for me is fundamentally what is happening. Um, and I would I would call that state monopoly capitalism or corporatism. And it's at the very least, it's a kind of creeping fascism. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the, just to clarify, if you two are going to try and take me down here, is that like generally from what I've, well, I've spoken to a few doctors about this, generally viruses will become more transmissible and less deadly. It's not always the case, but that's generally what's happening. And a few of them that I spoke to have said that's what they think we're seeing with Omicron. And it is a blessing and not the, the absolute nightmare scenario that we're all mm. being told it is. So, but to move on from the science, cause like that's where people get removed. Um, <laughs> we'll go back to like the, <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, the, this fusion of the state and corporations that you've talked about is, is, is so real because that's what we were seeing long before COVID hit. Like this is not like a brand new phenomenon. It's not something that's just appeared. We, we've been seeing that happening. And this this is what the, the outsourcing game has essentially been for the last 12 years or yeah, 11, 12 years since the, the Tories came in in 2010 and really kicked the neoliberalism up to 11. Um, and like the, the vaccine passports I've used as you completely and like very succinctly pointed out is like it's rent seeking. It is an attempt to 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 put in like a permanent profit profit or a permanent like source of revenue for themselves under the mm. guise of public health, but something that is doing nothing as far as I can tell to do anything about public health. It's about for me, it looks like it's a way to like bring in the the digital ID that, that the establishment have been begging to get in since well, I mean, I think the, the European Union proposal was in 2017. But like Tony Blair was trying to get mandatory ID cards put in place and our now wonderful prime minister said he would eat them with his cornflakes, but he seems to have disappeared. Um, so like, why do you think that this is not being seen by people? Like it doesn't even have to be like the mainstream commentators or the, the sort of media class. It, it doesn't seem to be like that, that idea that the vaccine passports are there for, for rent seeking and for an element of control it seems to be, and, and also to profit off the data that they can, they can, you know, make, yeah. you know, harvest from it. It's like, why do you think that's not being raised at all? Like, cause I've seen no one talk about the data protection implications or the, mm. the, the sort of compromise of the right to privacy where like your medical records shouldn't be sort of for the bouncer at the pub, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's horrifying. I mean, they like you say, this is um, a long term, um, generally intensifying trend. Uh, this fusion with the state and and uh, monopoly capital, um, and they have been able to manip because of they have so much power. You know, with their they control the media. That like people like us are stuck at the margins. We, we can't have the same influence. We just can't um, at the moment. Um, they have so much power through their control of the media. They totally control the narrative. I mean, or when, like, when they lose control of it slightly, they quickly, you know, recapture that control um, by becoming even more authoritarian, um, censoring their critics and so on. Um, and, yeah, I think, like... You have to think about um, the way people have been socialised over the last 20, 30 years as well, because people have grown up in a world where everything's being privatised and it just seems so normal. Mm. Um, and there's also the, the kind of... Um, 
I kind of feel like the commodity fetish is actually strengthening as cap as capitalism moves towards its its ultimate downfall because nobody actually wants the economy to collapse like obviously like no, nobody wants that like even communists don't, know, don't advocate that we we kind of know that it's going to take that before a revolution's going to going to be possible but we don't advocate like an acceleration towards collapse because that would obviously alienate people from us. So I think what kind of happens is you get this intensification of the commodity fetish where, and it's generalised, it's not just it's not just imposed, it's this kind of feeling that, oh God, the, the, if we don't privatise more of the economy, the, the economy is going to collapse. And that's, that's, the cap that's true, the capitalist economy will collapse without, if it doesn't pr privatise a sufficient amount of the um economy every, every with it every time it has a crisis like uh so we had the dot com yeah. bubble crash in 2000 2001 what happened more privatization what happened bigger bubble 2007-08 bigger crash uh what happened even more privatization what's all come off the back of that an even bigger bubble and an even bigger crash um yeah well so I mean, that, we haven't seen the crash yet but yeah <laughs> Well, we saw a very temporary one. We saw a very deep, but very temporary one. But you're right; the real crash is coming, and I, I think it's pretty, it's coming pretty soon, um, because China is experiencing its own housing financial crisis now. And the thing is, when we had the 2007 uh, 2008 crash, China kind of softened the blow in a on a global level. Because it, it, its economy, its industrial output was strong enough to, to deal with it. But now um, China's debt is, is absolutely massive, much bigger than it was back then. And it's, it's moving more and more towards automated production. So it's, it's industrial um, working class base is, is weakened. And so it, the, the, the crash is going to suffer. Is going to be much worse on a global level because there's going to be no one to cushion the blow this time. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are with with the with the crisis. But yeah, that that seems to me to be. The, I mean, I'm very much. If someone asked me if I've had a vaccine, I'm very much that private confidential information that I share with my doctor and no one else. Yeah, but, and I really really liked that Jeremy Corbyn had the exact same response when he was asked about it. It's like that. That's irrelevant. Like that is. It's you know. No one. Yeah. And and I feel the same way. He's like that's this. You know, if I'm sick, I'll stay at home. But yeah, you know, no one. No one needs to like ask my yeah medical status whenever I go somewhere. If I'm not coughing my guts up, then you know you can assume I'm. I'm not some deadly spreader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean which, they. This is the other benefit. So there's the there's the the vax passport is a, is a commodity and a and a sort of a rent seeking device. The other benefit is divide and rule, right? Like they know that like every ruling class resorts to this when it's in crisis, um, when its system is is crumbling around it. It resorts to divide and rule, and it resorts to segregation uh, increasingly. So. What they're trying to do, I mean, they, you've got this really, it's almost bizarro world now where the, the corporations are all like, um, supposedly anti racist like, like, and very, very, uh, upfront with that. Um, like, so we have now, we have, you go to the football stadium. If you can get in with your VAX passport, if you've got a VAX passport and then the footballers are taking a knee against all forms of discrimination, especially racism. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, uh, yeah. um, and no one, or at least a lot of people don't, don't want to see the contradiction there. Um, I mean, I've been um, fighting with a lot of Northern Irish politicians on Twitter about this. I, I wrote a, like a, I had to cut it down from like 7,000 words to like four. <laughs> um, because I was, but like, I was really trying to like, cause we've had, we had the vote on, on the vaccine passports this week as well in our own, um, local assembly, uh, at Stormont in Belfast. And, um, I just, I was trying to go through 
all of the statements by all of the parties and like try and get their official like line on it. And I tell you what, you see, trying to get them to tell me what it was about or explain their position was like pulling fucking teeth. Like I, I had the call so many times and there was nothing on their websites, no official statements anywhere, nothing. It's like they didn't even want to discuss it. But um, eventually I managed to get them to, to like a, a few of them at least to, to like tell me what their position was. So I got on the phone with a couple of them eventually. And they, they laid it out to me. They're like, this is about treating people differently because we want them to take the vaccine. And I was like, okay, thank you for finally saying that, right? Because that is discrimination. That is straight up like you're treating people differently based on an arbitrary metric that has no basis in reality. And mm. the, 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 the argument that, that I've seen made is that like the, the vaccinated are less likely to, to spread the disease. And that, you know, as far as I can tell, that's like roughly true for a certain period after you've taken the vaccine, right? And then, but even then it's, it's not effective. And therefore like you just, you're just basic, you're just discriminating based on nothing. And, and, and they, I don't understand why no one sees this. It's, it's the most insane thing that I've ever come across in my life. Like, They'll be tweeting, and I'm not even joking, the day that they voted for the vaccine passports, right? And they were they were saying, oh, you know, stop bleeding on about human rights. I won't take lectures on discrimination from the DUP, which, I mean, it's vaguely fair, but, like, you're meant to take the moral high ground. And then um, the same day they were talking about, they, there was a, a bill on, on, um, on something to do with abortion, um, and they were talking about being pro-choice and about you know, women's rights and, and, you know, my body, my choice. And I was like, are you, like, how tone deaf can you get? Like, you, you, do you not understand that there's, like, even a vague similarity here? Yeah, they, they don't want to hear this comparison. Um, and I'm not, like, saying it is a direct comparison, but it's at least adjacent, you know, it's... And, and, yeah, I'm and not least, saying it's the same, but, you know... No, but what what is... Um, race what is gender it's you know the left is constantly talking about these things as being social constructs that were i mean i actually call them economic constructs or economic social constructs because um they 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 arose as concepts to to um satisfy the needs of certain economies like whether it's before capitalism or or since capitalism um so what's happening now? Well, capitalism's in this deep crisis. During neoliberalism, during the last 30, 40 years, social liberalism has sort of um, risen and um, um, in, in strength and social con conservatism has sort of re declined relatively. So it's harder for capital to like backtrack on that. Uh, I mean, the reason that happened is because capital has become more international, um, workers are more integrated, and so on and so forth. So, you like it's capital has had to become more more international to to keep accumulation going. Um, it's needed migration to cheapen the labour base. Um, you know, personally, I think Black Lives Matter is about cheapening it, the workforce because. It's it's about cheapening recruitment, um, or it's about getting cheaper recruitment, um, especially for the state, because the state has the capitalist state has a poor record um, on on race, especially race matters. And what does it have at the moment? It has a, a mounting debt crisis and a a um, collapsing tax base. So what what do they want to do? They want to get rid of um the the older workers who work for the state and replace them with younger cheaper workers um to take take the the pressure off the tax base so that's that's one element of it as well i mean i'm not saying there's no like good or moral intent with black lives matter and i'm sure most of the followers are in it for for the anti racism absolutely but from the the corporations who are um, funding it and promoting it, that's their underlying motivation. Um, and so, so 
But now we've got the capitalist crisis and it's a very, very deep one and they need to find ways of dividing in, uh, in order to bolster their own rule again. So they can't like go, they can't go back on the social liberalism so much or they're going to struggle to because it's so like widely accepted by the population. So they need to find new ways of dividing the population. And so they need to create new, a new case system, um, caste system. Mm -hmm. And, um, it seems to me that this is the one they've come up with so far. Mm, um, and it, it, really it, it kind of feels like, um, you know, it, it kind of feels like at first they came for the unvaccinated scenario and, and then like, and then, the the unboost, unboost, then the unboosted yeah. and, and then what, I, I don't know what it will be next, but, you know, the unchipped or, or whatever it's going to be. Um, that kind of feels like the road we're going down. Mm, well, I mean, yeah, I think Israel have literally just voted to approve the fourth dose, I think. Um, and then, yeah, so as soon as that's rolled out, or I think it's maybe under debate, so I don't want to say that that's definitely um, thing, but um, it's under discussion, at least anyway, at which point the people who have taken their two doses and the booster will be then considered unvaccinated, uh, which is totally insane anyway. I mean, I don't know quite how we got here, but that that, that point you're trying to make about BLM is, is really interesting. Um, I mean, it, it, it's... I, I, there's this this really stark image in my head where it's not it's not BLM but it's kind of related is the it's like at the Pride Parade in I think it was New York and there was like the J P Morgan Chase like Pride float and I was just like do you think they care like do you really think they give a fuck about you and yeah. and yeah and when, what you were saying that sort of thing yeah I mean and for me most of that that like. Most of that is just like absolute virtue signaling to make people forget that some of these com like that these companies are the ones that are literally the worst in the world. Like mm. JP Morgan Chase are, are, are like were one of the chief architects of the 2008 crash. And, and you know, you can't just pretend, oh, well, you know, it's all right because, you know, they're tolerant to gay people and therefore yeah. that makes them good. It's like, you know, really, I wonder how many gay people's lives they destroyed when the economy yeah, crashed, is, exactly, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and it kind of, what you said there is, is about the caste system, it made me think of um, this interview I listened to with a guy called Rob Henderson, and he was talking about this concept of, of luxury beliefs, whereby um, he was making the point, um, and I kind of, I kind of, side with what he's saying here. I can understand it. He's saying that the the idea that everyone is equal, you know, that it doesn't matter your class, creed, color, religion, whatever, that everyone is, you know, an equal person is so accepted by the mainstream and by basically everyone in society now, which is awesome, you know, yeah. um, that they have to find a way to then that a lot of the, the ruling class who then get very obsessed with like race and sex and gender is them like trying to find a way to like delineate that they are the moral superiors and they are different to to the you know all the plebs down below um, and is that, that there's like a some sort of it's like it's like they're trying to to dis, like you know distinguish themselves from the plebs almost do you know what I mean and I, I was I hadn't I hadn't ever heard that concept like laid out and then I, it's just been it's just been sticking in my mind a little bit whenever I see anything about this I'm like. Is this their way of signaling that they are better than us? You know. Yeah, I mean, th this is. I mean, there's all sorts of things going on. Like the the, the ruling class itself is more diverse than it mm -hmm. than it than it was a hundred years ago. You know, a hundred years ago it was almost exclusively white yeah. uh, and male in in uh, in the Western world. Yeah. Um, Which is why I always think the stupid like Jews run the world conspiracies are completely insane. It's because like they don't give a fuck what who, what religion you are. It's like, are you yeah. rich? Do you buy into their system? Great, you're in the club. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This this is it. I mean, it's it's capitalists. They they own production, and the the thing that's really going on, like because they, obviously, if you you get onto that sort of thing, like the the right wing some of the right wing conspiracy theorists and, and and fascists you know talk about a cabal um a secret cabal ru ruling everything that's not true but what is happening is that capital is concentrating into fewer and fewer hands mm. um so you get 
certain capitalists becoming more and more powerful. Um, yeah. The other thing that's going on in 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 the region of what we're talking about is obviously the capitalists don't want to attack too many people. They don't want to bite off more than they can chew. So they want to keep, you know, black people on side, LGBT, the LGBT movement on side as much as possible. Um, but, you know, buy off a big, big enough portion of, of it, you know, as far as you can call it a community or whatever you want to call it. Cause obviously there's lots of divides within those movements um which are usually class divides um um so yeah th there's that aspect that that's that's um part of what what captain is trying to do and we could see it flip like if like if if you get a big um if you get a big economic collapse you could see like obviously you'll see an even greater concentration of of wealth into fewer hands and that that itself necessitates a broader attack on the population mm. um, economically. I mean, we're already seeing that with inflation. Yeah. Like, that's hitting the, the, the poorest the hardest. Totally. It, like, and this is why I think lockdowns were not about public health at all. I think they, they, it was about the fact that they had to restructure the economy so drastically um, that they wouldn't have been able to get away with it. Um, without a lockdown and they certainly mm. wouldn't have been able to do it without um without brute force um on the streets and obviously they have been doing that in france they've had to they've had to do that in france but the state doesn't want to do that because that's very expensive they have to spend if they're taking people on in the streets like you've seen in france that's hitting the tax base and the tax base is eating into profits it because like if you um, are spending, if the if the state is spending money on the public or on public services, that is money that could have been going towards subsidising capital, and and therefore could have been uh, relieving flatlining profit margins. So that without That's like it's actually uh, yeah, arguably arguably funding the police is actually helping the economy because they would like go and spend the money in like the real economy. <laughs> well, partly, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a two way thing. Um, you know, if the state is buying police equipment from a private company, then that company, that company's capital is benefiting in that way. But at the same time, it's depleting the state's, um, uh, tax revenue and that, which could have gone to capital in a, in a different way. Um, like, and I mean, the thing for me about the, that I want to, I, I don't know if you're going to want to cut this, but the thing about the, the like booster after booster thing, like Cuba isn't doing that. Um, as far as I know, it's said that the vaccines they're using is, um, combating, has been combating the variants. So they haven't had to do, other vaccines and, and now Cuba's using the traditional type of vaccine where you know what it is hang on oh here it is Cuba's bet on her because all right I'm going to read straight from the the source right in order to okay. make sure that we get this right so they are doing a three dose a three dose combination of it's called the Soberana jabs okay. um so this is from three weeks ago this is um on on nature.com um, yeah. And they're claiming they're saying that it has an efficacy of ninety two point four percent. So that's what they're using. So that's different to you're, you're absolutely accurate, and this is not dangerous misinformation. This is true. They're using a different vaccine. So yeah, yeah, it's, right. it's not a messenger RNA, which is what um, Pfizer and Moderna are using. Um, uh, it's a traditional vaccine. It's the type where they give you a little bit of broken. Uh, virus and your immune system attacks it and so on and so forth. Um, so that it knows how to deal with it. The mRNA ones, I'm not going to explain what they are. I think everyone's read about them now and th they know what they're doing, but they don't work in the same way. And, um, before 2020, they were considered to be too toxic. Like they hadn't got the right balance and they were, they were very, Moderna was very worried that it wasn't going to be able to bring it to market. 
um, because it had already like paid out its shareholders on the promise that this was going to come to market and this was going to be, you know, a, a money spinner. Um, so the the this crisis came along just in time for them, and you know it. Like I said, because the state, because capital is becoming so dependent on the state, I do think that that is an obvious recipe for um, state medical abuse on a, on a bigger scale than we've seen with, with something like the opioid crisis in the US, where basically they're paying doctors to overprescribe opiates, which they uh, also claimed were not addictive. Just to, yeah. just to say yeah, that, like, I mean, absolutely. I've done a lot. I've done. I did a lot of writing on this a few years ago. Yeah, they, they were crooks, you like know. absolute crooks. Um, yeah, and yeah, Pfizer so my, also the recipient of the biggest, the biggest lawsuit in in human history uh, exactly. for falsi falsifying um, test results and uh, trial results and for bribing doctors. That was two point three billion dollars. They were fined. Mm. That would normally put someone out of business. <sighs> Yeah, for no. them. <laughs> for them, I mean, they are struggling um, in terms of their profit margins, but in terms of absolute wealth, you know, they're very rich. Mm. Um, yeah, for me, it's it's concer it's very concerning. So you're um, basically saying that, like, because this is this is the point I've been trying to make to people is that, like, right, okay. For me, I don't I don't see any problem in the state like helping to fund like public health things in, in times of emergency. Like I have no problem with that. Like especially, um, especially something like this. And I, I like theoretically, I see no issue with, with public health, um, like but there being public spending, sorry, uh, with combined with private corporations in order to, you know, produce some new drug or research or vaccine in this, in this case, like I, that as a concept, like on its own, like doesn't seem offensive. Mm. To me, like it seems like a, a reasonable idea, um, especially in times of crisis. Like we've often seen, like in wartime, there would be like um, industries would be nationalized, and that, yeah, it's, it, with with a global crisis, it's not really like I don't know. It's not it's not quite practical to nationalize because you can't like it's like okay, so what country gets to be in charge? But I think the problem that that it becomes is that now we seem to be like we seem to be very very quickly sliding into a situation where we're always going to need another booster and therefore it's going to be locking in like a permanent profit for, and it's, it's again, it's going back to this idea of rent seeking. It's like locking in a permanent profit for some of the worst companies in the world, arguably. Yeah. And it's, it's basically just heaping more and more debt onto the public and onto the state. So it's completely unsustainable because there's only so much, I mean, firstly, there's only so much the population will take. But even without that, there's only so much you can rob them of. <laughs> like, So there is a bottom to this pit that they're, they're delving into. Um, and, yeah, I'm just concerned that these companies are very desperate to, to find a source of, of revenue. And, you know, the, the like in Britain, the... Um, the pharmaceutical industry has regulated itself since Thatcher. Like it, it, it's not regulated by the that state. Sounds so stupid when you say it, man. <laughs> I know, but it's and now and in America the we've seen industry is the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and like we've seen in the US, like some re some resignations um, from the federal drug agency from people who were. Um, we're basically complaining about, you know, lack of information, lack of access to data um, before that they approved of mandates and that sort of thing. And so any sort of um, like decent regulators, like the, the last ones seem to have been removed in the US as well. And so, yeah, we basically have this sort of worrying um, trend towards a almost completely unregulated or self-regulated medical industry um pushing I just drugs wanna, yeah i just want to say again i, I want to like because uh, yeah when we're talking about all these things um i want to i'm trying to make sure that we're, we're yeah accurately sourced here so this is from business insider it says the u.s food and drug administration announced the resignations of two top vaccine officials on tuesday 
This was from uh, September the 1st, 2021. And the report said the two were leaving in anger over the Biden administration's plan to roll out COVID-19 booster shots before the officials had a chance to approve it. So, mm. yeah. So, yeah, again, 100 percent accurate what you're saying. I just, yeah, I like to be really, really yeah, keen no, no. On, on these things, you know. Yeah, that's that's because it's yeah it's such a fraud topic. So, yeah. um, so then, so one of the things I, I then this this brings us quite nicely to um, we're talking a lot about sort of this crisis in capitalism, and um, perhaps this is where you and I disagree a little bit. Like my my view of it, at least, is that we are not so much witnessing a crisis of capitalism but a crisis of neoliberalism and a crisis of um, a system that has gone from, so economist Marky e. Thomas, who um, I'm hopefully going to have back on the show actually soon to, to discuss some of these issues because um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, of a different opinion than, than myself. But he points out that from 1945 to 1980, essentially, the economy was geared to to sort of, to, to, it was geared to like try and grow the economy and the, improve the, the livelihoods of everyone in the country. Like it was, uh, and we saw like across the board growth in wages and standards of living. And, um, you know, we did, we did a pretty solid job in like, obviously like having to pay to rebuild the country after the second world war was, was part of that. But, um, like we, we were able to have like across the board growth and like improvements in living standards. And then he says that around 1980, or 79, really, when Thatcher came to power, but she didn't really have much power until she won the Falklands War. Um, and she had then she had the political capital to do what she wanted, basically. But he points to that that period where it went from being geared to like the, the benefit of everyone to the economy being geared to the benefit of the one percent. And and that's where I think we lost the or well not we lost, but I think that's that system that's run from 1980 to here that has been focused on, yeah making the rich as rich as possible, essentially, and, and catering to their needs and not the, of everyone else. I see it as that system is collapsing and not capitalism itself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, I see uh, neoliberalism as a, as an absolutely necessary stage for capitalism to move on from, to. So, uh, so after the Second World War, what you're saying is absolutely right. But one thing we have to remember is that the 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 upfront costs of rebuilding the country were too high for capital and it also needed a healthy um labor base to to do that rebuilding so the demand for labor was very high and so the labor unions therefore became very strong and uh, won lots of gains um in social housing nationalized industry and so on and so forth. Um, then capitalism went into another crisis around, I mean, it, it really started in, in around 1969, but it, it started to really hit in 1973. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was the oil shock. And um, basically, the system got to a stage where it was like, well, do we nationalise the rest of the industry or do we privatise um, and therefore give capitalism a, a kickstart, you know, another kickstart? And um, obviously the capitalists wanted to, to privatise and they needed to um, because the, the fundamental problem of, with capitalism is that um, it tends to um, it tends towards abolishing its own source of profit, which is capital's exploitation of labor more specifically capitalism's exploitation of labor's labor time um so because capital needs to keep accumulating to offset its own devaluation um and to keep attracting enough investors um just for a company and the economy as a whole to stay profitable it needs to do several things. It needs to cheapen labour. It needs to cheapen production. It needs to expand production. It needs to innovate. Um, and it needs to also cheapen mergers. So it needs to, to monopolise industry. It needs to do all of those things 
to get capitalism accumulation started again on a higher level. So we had we've the system basically goes into some sort of crisis on average every ten years. So if you look back since the war and before that, every ten years or or so there's a recession, um, and they they are um, weaker or stronger depending on the previous period and how production has developed. But they do tend to get worse every time, mm-hmm. and so. All of these trends have intensified every time. Um, and so after 73, um, they had to start attacking the, the working class in the unions. They had to because they needed to cheapen labour um, but by outsourcing or what Marxists refer to as exporting capital to, to somewhere where they could cheapen and expand the, la- the, um, the labour base, which is why they needed to destroy the Soviet Union and Chinese socialism um they they needed to raise productivity so they needed to innovate so they needed machines to do more of the work because they machines can produce faster than humans you don't have to pay machines for um holiday pay or sick pay they don't even take toilet breaks um so you they they're basically squeezing as much um out of the day as possible in terms of production. But what they need to produce more than anything is surplus value. And surplus value is surplus labour time. So let's say you work eight hours a day. Um, let, so, so let's say, let me, let me try and simplify it. If you can't, if you couldn't measure wealth or the size of the economy with money, mm-hmm. what would you measure mm-hmm. it by? It, it would have to be, it would have to be time. You'd have to measure it in time, right? Yeah. So let's say you work eight yeah, hours a day. Yeah. Let's say you work eight hours a day and you get paid eight pounds a day. So you get paid one pound a day. In reality, what is really happening is you're keeping four of those hours or of those pounds and the capitalist is keeping the other four pounds. Now, as time goes on, um, he needs to increase the amount he's keeping because it's getting harder and harder to reproduce and expand the system um, even more than than it had to before because c- capitalist output and wealth tends to double every 20 years. That's what needs to happen for the system to, to, to survive. And so you're now working, uh, free, you're now getting three hours of the, of the the day that um, you worked and the capitalist is keeping five hours. And after the next crisis, you're only keeping two and they're keeping six. And you might actually be able to buy more with the two than you could with the three because the products that are being produced are cheaper. So there's this contradiction where we actually, um, even the working class, tends to increase its consumption of, of commodities we can't necessarily earn enough to get the basics like housing, but we can buy laptops and microphones and stuff like that. So this is the kind of, this is the kind of um, contradiction in the system. That's really, I think really glaring now is that capitalism gives the impression that it's working towards a, a like um, a productive system of, of abundance for all even as we're getting poorer because the products, um, the commodities are getting cheaper, like the laptops we're talking on, the computing power um, um, that runs them cost millions of pounds like 40 years ago. But now we could, like now an individual, now a worker can buy one for a few hundred pounds. They can save up and buy one for a few hundred pounds. Um, so... But the problem now is that capitalism, I, I think, is is capitalism, not just neoliberalism, is coming up against like an his, a historical limit, because like you don't even really need to think about the Marxist um, analysis of the labour theory of of, uh, of value mm-hmm. to sort of grasp the, the fact that the more abundant production becomes, the cheaper it gets, and so. Prices, which is like, yeah, the virtue, which is like one of the virtues of, of capitalism. Like, I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's, which is, it's, yeah, it's, it's the it's the reason it's, it does good things as well. Yeah, you know? 
Yeah, the thing with capitalism is it's kind of like three steps forward, two steps back all the time. It's it's that sort of um, it's that sort of dynamic, um, uh, like. Pr- pr- Productive abundance is great. That's that's what Marxism's all about. It's it's about um, you know creating abundance for all, and that that's how you get rid of class. That's how you get to a classless society is by making by making everyone rich, giving everybody economic independence. Mm. But you can't get there without getting rid of capitalism because it's going to collapse. Um, and you know we can argue Does about that whether mean you need Bitcoin is Marxist. No, but I, um, <laughs> but, I, but I do think I do think it's kind of a pre-socialist trend because it's a sign that money is becoming worthless, right? Mm. Um, money is money is so abundant. I mean, the US printed seventy five percent of all US dollars in the last decade and forty percent in the last year. Like, so all of the dis. I, obviously, they print them digitally now. Yeah, but, print. <laughs> but you, know, you, can, <laughs> you can see that money itself is becoming because money is a commodity. Money is a commodity, um, uh, like any other commodity. So the same is happening. The value of money is disappearing. The same as the va- of the the value of any of these abundant, uh, abundantly produced commodities. Oil, the price of oil fell below zero in April 2020 for the first time ever. And then we had an oil yeah, crisis. literally couldn't give it away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had to pay people to, to, to store it. Mm. Um, and then we had an oil crisis. What's, all, what's that about? Well, obviously, they've cut production or at least pretended to, like, and, and they've made it less accessible because they had to get the price back up. Um, and they... they Firstly, just to sell it, but secondly, to get their profit margins back up, to centralise wealth into fewer hands, because that's that's the the debt for the crisis is such that you have to take from other people to to offset the devaluation of your own wealth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you've, you've, you've yeah. Well, essentially, yeah. What we're what we're witnessing is like an on steroids accumulation of wealth by the very wealth that, of, of wealth and. And, and assets by the the richest in our society, and it's a yeah. very concerning trend that not very many people seem to care about. I mean, I was arguing with someone earlier about this, and they were like, "Yeah," I was like, "You know, the lockdowns, you know, enabled the, the greatest upward transfer of wealth in human history." And they were like, "No, no, austerity did that." And I was like, "No, this is so much bigger, man. Like you, <laughs> yeah." But uh, I keep, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna have to stop here because I have to run for a bus in like five minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want to finish your? Do you want to finish your last point? Then? I was just going to say, people on the left keep saying things like, "Oh, we can't go back to austerity," but like you say, this is a austerity on on steroids. Um, like, I don't know how they don't see that. I, I I don't know if it's just denial or something, but um, it's fear as well. Yeah, yeah, fear triggers denial. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, triggers a lot of things. But um, yeah, Ted, unfortunately, I'd love to stay and talk, but I, I, yeah, no I was probably going to have to definitely ask you back on the show at some point because, yeah, okay, we've great. got a lot more to talk about. But yeah, yeah. thanks for reaching out and, and I really appreciate your time, man. Do you want to just like plug any, any of your work here before we go, point people towards uh, you? Firstly, just thanks to you, thanks to you as well for, for having me on. It's It's been a um, very important discussion, I think, and one that we need more people to sort of start um, get digging into. Um, because obviously a lot of people are reluctant to, to, to do that. Um, yeah, you can get my books online, um, Socialism or Extinction, um, and the other one is um, Humanising Production, and I've got a book out with zero with zero books in May, June, I think, uh, called Henrik Grossman, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> called uh, The End of Capitalism, The Thought of Henrik Grossman, and that's about Henrik Grossman, who was in my view, the best Marxist of the 20th century, um, who really sort of um, sort of um, brought Marxism back to, to what it was meant to be, which is like a scientific economic analysis of capitalism. Well, I will get you back on when the book comes out then. That's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. But yeah, man, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time. You too. Thanks very much. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast. 
If you want to leave us a comment, that would be awesome. Please like, share, subscribe, and if you're listening on Apple, please leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.